Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings the 40th episode of Star Wars Comics in Canon. So thanks guys for listening. Let's get on with the show. So this week I'm carrying on with the main run of Star Wars comics. However, this one's a little bit different because I'm doing five of the main run of Star Wars and then one of the Star Wars annuals. And until I did this show and had to research all of the Star Wars comics, I didn't even realize that Star Wars did the annuals. Essentially, when series run for over a year, they release once a year this sort of one-off special story. There's a couple of Vader ones, there's a couple of Afro ones, and there's a couple of Star Wars ones. Well, I say a couple, obviously there are more than two because this is the third Star Wars annual, um, but I won't be tackling that to the end. But all of the stories within this podcast are all in the same trade paperback, which is volume six, Out Among the Stars. And for clarity, the reason it's a little bit different is because instead of each of these being like one arc, which is what I normally tackle, these are all individual stories. So each comic is basically a pair of people going off and doing their own things generally. And I will say there are, before doing this, I was a bit skeptical and I was like, ah, this isn't going to be the best one because often sort of anthology one-off stories can be a bit weak, um, especially in Star Wars. Unfortunately, I just generally prefer sort of longer story arcs when there's a bit more depth to them and things. But a couple of these are genuinely really really good i would really recommend anyone just checks out the issue 36 which is with r2d2 it's just him killing loads of stormtroopers and it's amazing um but i'll get onto that in a second so uh let's tackle all the other stuff first so issues 33 to 37 are all written by Jason Aaron. They are all drawn, well, the artist for all of them is Salvador La Roca, and the colorist for all of them is Edgar Delgado. Issue number 33 was released in July 2017. Issue 37 was released October 2017, and the trade paperback collection of all of them was released in December 2017. And just for clarity, even though these stories are sort of anthology-like, going forward, the main run of Star Wars comics goes back into the arc sort of format. And in about a month's time, when I tackle the next batch of Star Wars comics, it will be an arc specifically about Rogue One. It's going to be called The Ashes of Jeddah, and some familiar faces pop up there. So I just want to clarify, this isn't how the next 40 issues of the main run of Star Wars comics are going to be. This is just kind of like a special one, essentially. All of the stories in the main run of Star Wars comics are set between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. The ones that I'm tackling here are around the tail end of the first year after A New Hope, and there are about three years between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, so that's generally where they are. It is also worth mentioning that these are the last comics that are written by Jason Aaron in the main run of Star Wars. It soon gets taken over by Kieran Gillen, and Kieran Gillen is the one who did the first run of Vader comics, which I've tackled all of those on this show, as well as the first 19 Afro comics, which are currently ongoing on the show. And the last little thing before I get started, I would recommend you check out episode 13 of Star Wars Comics in Canon if you haven't already, or alternatively, you should read the second volume of the main run of Star Wars. It's called Showdown on Smuggler's Moon, just because there's a few things in there that kind of reoccur in here. So yeah, you don't need to, it's not essential, but it probably makes it a little bit better for reading slash listening. So with that all in mind, let's get started. So first up is issue number 33. It is titled Rebels in the Wild, and here's the title crawl. It is a time of turmoil for the galaxy. While the evil galactic empire remains strong, the Rebel Alliance continues to fight for freedom. Luke Skywalker struggles with his destiny. He can feel the Force, but lacks the training to become a Jedi Knight. When Dr. Aphra approaches him with an artifact containing the consciousness of an ancient Jedi, Luke accompanies her to the Sittal of Kathakhtan. Overcome with telepathic parasites, Luke is able to overcome their control and free the people of the Citadel, along with the rebellion leader, Princess Leia. Despite this, danger still lurks as the surviving parasites aren't the only ones hunting for Luke and Leia. Now for clarity, what that is referencing is the Screaming Citadel crossover, which was between the Dr. Afro comics and the main run of Star Wars comics, and this is the story set straight after that. And for clarity, I tackled that on episode 36 of Star Wars Comics in Canon, and it's a pretty cool one. You, it's a really cool story I would recommend. So, shooting ahead then. So, Leia and Luke crash land on this sort of water world, and they seem to be there for about three weeks. They hunt this being called the Spine Shark, which I've taken a photo of, you would see on Instagram and things. Uh, they make a fire, and they lay down and look at the stars together. And 
in this comic and in each of these sort of individual comics, there is a, a narration going on by one of the main characters. In this one, it is Leia. I'm not going to read it all because, you know, I do want you guys to pick up some of these comics and actually get something out of them. So this is just me giving you the general basis of stories and connecting a few dots here and there. But here's an interaction between Leia and Luke. Um, one of Leia's internal monologues says, Three weeks we've been stuck on this island and we still can't get the message out, not through the nebula cloud above us. Three weeks and no one even knows we're here, except maybe the Empire. And now this is Luke and Leia's exchange, I'm going to start with Luke. You still look for it, don't you? Every time I look up. And the weird part is, sometimes it's still there. We're so far away right now, the light from the explosion still hasn't reached us. It's hard not to feel like, if I just fly towards that spot, it will still be there. How'd you learn all this stuff growing up on Alderaan? How to hunt and survive in the woods? I mean, no offence, I mean, I picture a princess living in a big castle her whole life. You're not wrong. I ran away for the first time when I was nine years old. I was worried my parents were secretly planning to marry me off to some prince I'd never laid eyes on before. So I ran off when I was a little kid and hid in the woods. It took the palace guards a week to track me down. Best week of my life. I want to read that part out for two reasons. The first one, and the main one, is because they're talking obviously about Alderaan blowing up from A New Hope. And it's just, it's a real nice and quite upsetting thought to think that obviously Alderaan blew up and there's so many light years away, you look up and you can still kind of see it. That's just one of those things that I hadn't really thought about in Star Wars, which is quite somber in a lot of ways. And the other thing I want to mention as well is there's a book out called Leia, Princess of Alderaan. It's written by Claudia Gray, and Claudia Gray is a person who's a Star Wars author who I actually interviewed on this very podcast a few episodes ago. And Leia, Princess of Alderaan is set when Leia is about 16 years old, and the general premise is she basically finds out her family, uh, Bale and Breha Organa, they are both in the rebellion it's a really cool book and although it's under the young adult readers sort of banner it is still a really really good book for adults it's, it's a coming of age sort of story and it gives a lot more context to Leia and why she's so good in lots of different scenarios like this so I feel like it's almost a missed opportunity for them not to have gone hey why don't you read Leia Princess of Alderaan it will teach you some stuff about Leia but you know obviously they don't really do that that much in these comics I've noticed while reading a lot of Marvel comics when a certain event happens there's a little asterisk and says oh check out issue number blah 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 to find out they don't really do that in the Star Wars comics very much uh, which might be a missed beat but who knows um, but yeah I'd say if you want to know more about Leia and her sort of there's orienteering, I think, and sort of pathfinding and all kinds of other stuff like that, as well as a bit more backstory on Amelyn Holdo, then I would recommend checking out the book because it is cracking. Anyway, back to the comics. So Leia and Luke make some moisture evaporators, which obviously Luke used to be a moisture farmer on Tatooine. So they use some of the parts from the ship and things, which has been damaged going through the nebula, escaping the TIE fighters and whatnot. And they have managed to make some moisture evaporators, which they're basically the things that get moisture out of the air so you can drink water. Luke was a moisture farmer on Tatooine, so he knows how to build those things. So they're never out of water, but they do need to hunt. And that's why, you know, they were hunting the spine shark and other things. They then hear an explosion and it seems quite apparent that the Empire is on its way. So when that happens, they notice some natives sort of coming out of the water looking a little bit sheepish. They look a little bit like Abe Sapien from Hellboy or the fish man from Shape of Water. That general kind of idea thing is like, almost humanoids who lived in water. They've got this whole, like, whole civilization underwater, but obviously there's no way to communicate in things. And Leia and Luke decide, look, if the Empire are going to attack, we need to protect these people and get the Empire away before the Empire knows about all these underwater cities and things because it's going to cause problems. So that night, they basically start a giant fire to attract the Imperials, and an at, -AT comes out of the water. at, -AT are those gigantic walker things that are first shown in Empire Strikes Back on Hoth. They stand for All-Terrain Armored Transport, and obviously they're fairly difficult to destroy if you don't have the right weaponry. Luke and Leia set up a lot of traps and things. They set up like tripwires that shoot off spines, which were dipped in toxins. The spines were ones from the spine shark they killed, and toxins were from this paralytic toxic fish thing. So they set up some traps and things. It catches a lot of the Imperial soldiers that are going towards them. Luke ambushes some of them with a lightsaber as well. And then Leia shoots a fire arrow at the at, -AT. Now, what they do is they surround it and put some deadlinite on it. Now, deadlinite is a mineral used to manufacture blasts and things. It's mentioned in Chewbacca 1 and Star Wars Resistance, which is the animated show. And when I say Chewbacca 1, I mean the first Chewbacca comic. That's in the Heroes for a New Hope collection, which I tackled on the show a little while ago. And it doesn't seem to be mentioned much elsewhere in canon, but it's basically just the thing that powers the blasters in Star Wars is Deadlinite. And because of the way they sort of spread out the limited Deadlinite they had, and also Leia mentions that like animal droppings and certain other things are really, really flammable, she manages to, along with Luke, 
basically blow up an AT-AT using all of these things. They then use the remaining parts of the AT-AT to fix their ship and escape, and the story ends with Lando speaking with Sana Staros. So as I said, a lot of these stories here are quite thin in a way. It's more so some of the dialogues and some of the little moments that happen in a lot of these are quite cool. Uh, I will say that the Leia and Luke one is probably the weakest of all of them. So if it hasn't quite grabbed you yet, then that's understandable because the thing I read out about Alderaan is probably the highlight. It is This is one of those kind of fillery stories, but I, the Lando and Sana one that's coming up in a sec, I love. The Then the next couple are really good. So yeah, let's crack on to the next one, number 34. So this one is called The Thirteen Crates. It is a time of turmoil for the galaxy as the evil galactic empire rules with an iron fist, however for those daring and skilled enough to defy and evade imperial forces, there is potential for profit. Lando Carizian, smuggler turned galactic entrepreneur, makes his mark on the universe as a disreputable businessman moving goods and skirting along the edges of imperial law. When he's approached by skilled bounty hunter and fellow smuggler, Sana Staros, she offers him a deal he can't refuse. Together, Sana and Lando embark on a gamble as they attempt to move on one of the biggest scores of their lives, or die trying. Now for clarity, Sana Staros, she's a character who is almost solely in the main run of Star Wars comics. She is tackled in some of the earlier episodes. Her and Han have a history, basically. They like pretended to be married at one point to kind of con someone, but it wasn't a real marriage, etc. And also, Sana Staros has some sort of past relationship with Dr. Aphra, which is cool in itself as well. That kind of gets tackled a little bit in one of the previous Star Wars stories about the giant rebel prison, um, because Sana and Dr. Aphra have that kind of interaction. And also in the second run of Dr. Aphra comics, Sana Staros makes an appearance again. So cracking on with the narrative of this. It starts off with Lando and Sana, they're in a bar and they basically make a deal, and then it shows a flashback to two days prior. Sana sells a box of Imperial guns to Krog pirates and promising them there's going to be 12 more on the way, so they give her 5,000 credits as a sort of deposit and say that they'll give her another 15,000 when she delivers the other 12 crates. Now these Krog pirates, they're basically giant crab people, but I can't find any other record of them in canon, so um, I have taken a photo, so you'll be able to see it on once again. I'm going to be posting, I've got photos of all of the title crawls and the covers of all of these issues, as well as one photo from each of the insides of the comics of a panel I think is kind of cool in some way, and they're all going to be posted on Instagram and on Facebook as well, so on either Saturday when this comes out, or maybe the Sunday the day after, you should be able to find those if you're interested. So anyway, a sort of present day, Sana and Lando go to Coruscant and they go to some Imperials and basically say that they'll sell information to them to tell them who stole these missing 13 crates of blasters that they lost. And they have a bit of back and forth and Sana kind of puts a gamble in, kind of pushes the buttons of the Imperial officer and they basically say that they'll give her 20,000 credits to let them know. She blames the Krogs for stealing the blasters. Lando and Sana then go to Jabba the Hutt on Tatooine, and basically she blames the Krogs for stealing the crates from Jabba. She says she knows that Jabba has 12 crates, but he is actually missing one of them, and she says that the Krogs stole the last one. As she's trying to say that, a Krog, who is sort of undercover, pops up and says, I've been following you, Sana, and before he can basically finish the statement, she shoots him immediately. A very quick shot, it's quite cool. And... What is this Krog holding? He's holding one of those blasters, because obviously she, she sold them to them a couple days ago. So she uses that and says, look, he's got one of these stolen blasters, it was clearly him. They all sort of celebrate and things, and then it cuts to sort of the next day, and Sana and Lando are chatting and things, and Sana says that she actually took the 13th crate from Jabba a little while ago, and that's when she sold it to the Krogs. And Lando's like, well, that sounds a bit, you know, dangerous and things, and she says, well, while you were drinking and watching those girls with Jabba last night, I managed to sneak and steal the other 12 crates from them. And it turns out that Jabba actually only found them because there was just an Imperial ship that kind of got lost. Its life support systems failed and all the crew had died. So the ship just crashed onto Tatooine with no one alive on it and Jabba just took the blasters. And yeah, say 13 crates of blasters. And for clarity, the blasters are standard Imperial issue blasters that stormtroopers have. They're called E-11 blaster rifles. Then while Sana is flying off with now 12 crates of blasters, her ship gets attacked by the Krogs. While they're sort of shooting and things, Lando's freaking out quite a bit, and then an Imperial Star Destroyer appears, and the Imperial Star Destroyer starts to shoot at the Krogs and arrests them. Obviously, because she sold them the weapons before, they're still going to have them on their ship. Sana and Lando manage to quick punch in the coordinates for light speed and disappear, and Lando says that he can't believe that Han never married her for real, which I think is just brilliant. 
Then Sana says that obviously she paid Lando and the only other thing Lando requested was to have a date and a dinner. So they sit down to have dinner at this place that Sana kind of knows from her past and Lando starts to eat what he's been given and says this is one of the worst things I've ever eaten in my life and so he says look I'll just take the money and we can forget about this dinner date and then he kisses her on the hand and leaves. After he leaves, the bartender comes over and speaks to Sana like they're familiar and things. And she says, right, you can get rid of this food now. You can put it back in the garbage where you took it out from and bring over some real food. So they served up Lando stuff that had been thrown away, which is probably why it tasted so bad, which is just brilliant, just so she could avoid having a dinner date with Lando Carizian. And then in the bar, the last little panels of Sana's story is she can overhear a few people chatting and things. And one of them says, do you hear about all those credits that someone left for a hospital, like down the road and things? Oh, I can't believe that happened. Yeah, that that's definitely couldn't have happened. Who would leave that amount of credits for just a simple hospital? And it is basically Sana grew up around those parts and things and she grew up poor. So she understands that when there's certain places that need it, she has kind of got that good moral code. And that's where that comic ends. Apart from this little preview of the next comic, which is with... Han Solo. So issue number 35 is called The Hut Run. And you'll be able to tell that the first little paragraph of a lot of these crawls is basically the same thing, so I'm just going to start skipping them, otherwise I'll be repeating myself loads. So, legendary smuggler and all-round scoundrel Han Solo was roped into the rebellion after a simple charter trip taken to pay off his debt to the notorious crime lord Jabba the Hutt turned into rescuing the rebellion leader, Princess Leia, from the Death Star. Since then, Han Solo and his Wookiee co-pilot Chewbacca have performed odd jobs and miraculous feats alike in order to keep their friends alive and the rebellion running, usually to the chagrin of everyone involved. So I would say this one is probably my favourite comic of all of the ones I'm tackling in this episode. The next one with R2-D2 is brilliant just because watching R2-D2 kill loads of stormtroopers is just amazing. But this one I think has probably got the best story and the best consistent interesting parts to it. And this has got Han Solo's sort of narrative to it. So I'm going to read a couple of things of Han Solo's narrative and then he's going to be having a conversation with Mon Mothma. Now, for clarity, Mon Mothma, you would recognize her. She's in A New Hope, and I think she's in the rest of the original trilogy. She's kind of like a leader there. She's in Rogue One as well. She is in the Clone Wars series. She's in Star Wars Rebels in one episode as well. And she's basically a woman who wears all white. She has ginger or red hair, depending on how you want to define it. And she is a, or was the senator for Chandrilla. And her and Leia are basically the two main people who started the rebellion. Well, Leia's father, Bail Organa, and Mon Mothma are the two main people who started the rebellion. And then in the films that we see, when the rebellion is kind of ongoing, Mon Mothma is more sort of the organizational side, while Leia is more of the hands-on, front-of-the-battlefield sort of side. Um, and you should be able to recognize her. She's quite a prominent character, and she's very important. She also appears in the that Princess Leia book I mentioned, Leia, Princess of Alderaan. She's in that a little bit as well, and you get to see her first interactions with Leia, so that's really cool too. So, here's Han's narrative. Why the hell am I still here? Believe me, I ask myself the same question all the time, especially on days like today. And now this is between Han Solo and Mon Mothma, so it's going to be starting with Mon Mothma. I almost cannot believe I'm about to say this, but you are our only hope, Han Solo. You're kidding, right? I've always been your only hope. Everyone around here is crazy except me, but just cut to the chase, will you? How ridiculous a thing are you about to ask me to do, Mon Mothma, on a scale of one to blowing up a Death Star? This is a mission for which you are uniquely suited to, Captain, I assure you. We need you to smuggle something for us. Past Imperial patrols to the far side of the galaxy. Alright, now you're speaking my language. What kind of cargo are we looking at here? See for yourself. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You remember Gracchus the Hut, I assume? Yes, and the answer is no. I'm not putting a hut on the Falcon. I just don't have Darth Vader as a co-pilot. Gracchus was recently liberated from Imperial custody when Alliance forces intercepted his prison transport vessel. He could prove a valuable asset. It's said he has a hidden safe house somewhere in the Outer Rim with enough weaponry and supplies to support an entire army. I'm sure he does, but Gracchus isn't your ordinary hut. I mean, just look at him. He could tear the horns off a reek with his bare hands. If the Empire couldn't get him to talk, what makes you think you can? That part will not be your problem, Captain Solo. General Draven will be in charge of the interrogation. Then let him be in charge of it here. I've got better ways to risk my life. And it goes back and forth for a little bit. And then eventually Mon Mothma says, Gracchus could help us end this war. And the sooner we end it, the sooner we will all be safer. Smugglers and princesses alike. What's that supposed to mean? It means we need your help. All of us. Yeah, but why did you say, I am told you are the greatest smuggler in all the galaxy? Yeah, I suppose I am. 
Then all I need is for you to be yourself, Captain Solo. I am being myself, by not, by... Oh, hell. So there's a little bit to unpack there. Gracchus the Hutt, he is first shown in the second volume of Star Wars comics. It's the one I mentioned right at the start that's worth checking out if you haven't. It's when Luke is in the arena and he gets trained up by the Taskmaster a little bit. Gracchus the Hutt has got like a whole room full of Jedi artifacts and things. He's a very big hut and he's got these robotic legs coming out of the side of him. So it's almost like a giant slug, but kind of with like millipede like legs and he has like a six pack but it's actually like an eight pack so he's meant to be one of the most dangerous huts there is uh, unlike Jabba who's considered although very clever he's a bit of a slob Gracchus is violent he's shredded essentially and he can actually speak galactic basic so for who's listening to this he can basically speak English I also wanted to mention that there's the character mentioned General Draven now General Draven actually appears in Rogue One He's the one who speaks with Cassian and tells Cassian to kill Galen. He's the one who orders the attack on Edu. Um, he's also mentioned in Rebel Rising and is in a few more Star Wars comics, but if you watch Rogue One, you, you would recognise him. He's the one in charge who talks to Cassian quietly and sends him on the sort of darker missions in some ways. So anyway, it goes on to the Falcon where you've got Han, Chewie and Gracchus the Hutt all in the sort of cockpit area. And then some Imperial TIE Fighters appear, and as they're trying to outmanoeuvre some of the TIE Fighters, Gracchus's elbow kind of catches one of the switches. And that's just as the Millennium Falcon's about to travel at light speed and disappear, and they can't, which is a surprising thing, not really surprising for the Falcon. He points at Gracchus and says, like, this is you, and he's like, look, I'm really sorry, if I bumped anything, it was purely by accident, I didn't mean to. So they get shot at quite a lot and things like that, and while that's all happening, Gracchus is trying to talk Han out of leaving the Rebellion. He's saying, if you let me go, I'll make you richer than you ever wanted, and you can keep being a smuggler, there won't be these rules and things that you have to follow, you know, just let me go. While this is happening, the TIE Fighters are calling out to the Falcon, telling them to basically stop or they're going to destroy them, and they are currently shooting at them at the time. Han sets out a message saying, okay, that's fine, let's land at this nearest asteroid, you can board the ship and see that nothing's wrong. So the Imperials basically board the ship, they go around and they all get killed. Gracchus the Hutt kills quite a few of them, and Han and Chewie shoot a few more. After all the Imperials are dead, Gracchus grabs Han by the throat, slams him against a wall, and demands that Chewbacca takes him to Teth, otherwise he's going to kill Solo. Han says, Teth, what's on Teth? Why would you want to go there? And Gracchus says, everything I need to get myself back to where I belong, back in power. Hurry up, Wookiee. Take us there as fast as this crate of junk will go. And Solo says, that's, that's probably enough, right? I'm pretty sure that's enough. Solo code 795, level 3. And as he says that, a massive noise as you see Gracchus the Hutt shouts out in pain and you can see electricity flying from him as Solo has dropped. And Solo says, did you get all that, Draven? And you hear him say, over the comms, Teth, we're checking it now. And Han says, Chewie, you can turn the hyperdrive back on, let's get moving. And as Gracchus starts to reach for Solo, he says, Solo code 795, level 4. And a massive shock goes through Gracchus again. Han explains that while Gracchus was in custody and when he was actually sleeping, they managed to put some electric charges that were voice activated into his legs and things. And Draven then says on the comms that the X-Wings are en route now, and that it got a little bit hairy with the Imperials, and Han says it was all part of the plan. And Gracchus keeps sort of struggling and trying to threaten Han, and each time he does, he says Solo Code 795 and slowly increases the level. And you keep hearing Gracchus in the background getting shocked. And Han says that the one main weakness the Huts have is that they're arrogant. And Han says, you offered me my old life back, Gracchus, but guess what? I never stopped being me. And then he says Solo Code, level 9. And Han says to himself that being a rebel does have its moments. And then that's basically where the comic ends, aside from a little preview, onto the next one. So this is issue number 36, and it's called Revenge of the Astromech. This is one where I will give you guys the general plot and things, but this is probably the one that benefits the most from actually reading it and seeing the panels and things. An Imperial siege on Turin 7 compelled Alliance heroes Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Han Solo to intervene. Darth Vader dispatched Scar Squadron, an elite group of stormtroopers, to stop them. Although humiliated and disgraced when the rebel forces were able to break the siege, Scar Squadron did not emerge empty-handed. They captured C-3PO. Scar Squadron has turned their focus to extracting as many rebel secrets as possible from the protocol droid. Meanwhile, R2-D2, concerned for his fellow droid and friend, has abandoned the rest of the rebel force in order to launch a solo rescue mission. Now for clarity, it was in one of the previous Star Wars stories, so I think it was just before the Screaming Citadel. It might be just at the end of it, but I think it might be just at the start. Uh, essentially, uh, yeah, when C-3PO was taken away, R2-D2 stole an X-Wing to go by himself to go and find him. 
It is also confirmed in this comic that C-3PO basically doesn't have any rebel secrets. He doesn't really know anything important that the rebels know or anything like that. I mean, R2-D2 does. R2-D2 records almost everything he's been involved with, but obviously people just think he's a little astromech and doesn't really know much because astromechs generally get updated quite frequently and wiped and that sort of thing. But obviously that R2-D2 hasn't had an update basically ever. So R2-2 is flying the X-Wing and it goes near the Star Destroyer and powers down. It gets picked up by the Star Destroyer which is called the Infiltrator and Darth Vader is on board. R2-D2 has pulled out the X-Wing because he's inactive and he takes out an entire squad of Stormtroopers with his Electro Prod and a lot of other things. He plugs into the Star Destroyer and then basically tricks the troopers to shoot each other because he can access the mainframe and things, which is something that a lot of Astromechs shouldn't really be able to do. But because R2 is basically a legend and he's been in the game for so long, he can hack into almost anything. So he does that and he starts giving false information to certain parts who are like the command center of the Star Destroyer. So some troopers think in one place there's like this killer droid destroying everyone and then R2 sends the other troopers to the same location. There's like smoke and things from all the fire going on and a lot of the troopers just shoot each other. R2 also activates lots of internal defenses, including fire, ejection, the garbage disposal, which is obviously the famous scene from A New Hope when they fall in there uh, after they rescue Princess Leia. And so it's just fun little nods and stuff like that. Then R2-D2 saves 3PO and it's mentioned by 3PO that Chewie actually upgraded his weapons. But if R2-D2 uses them too much, it might drain his power too much. But that would explain how R2 has managed to take out so many of the stormtroopers. R2 flies the X-Wing out, and although there's no signs of life on the ship, they're still trying to shoot it at the Star Destroyer, and they can't quite hit it. So Vader gets in his TIE fighter and goes out. Vader does kill the captain of the ship for being incompetent before he enters his TIE fighter in a standard Vader fashion, and then, yeah, he starts to go after R2-D2. Not knowing who's in the ship, he just knows it's a droid. And, and one thing Vader says is, to quote him, I sense no life aboard that ship. It is a droid pilot, but a skilled one. He has learned well from someone, but not well enough. And just for clarity, in the Clone Wars animated series, R2-D2 is with Anakin Skywalker almost the whole time. So obviously R2-D2 learnt to fly the X-Wing like Anakin Skywalker, which is quite, once again, it's one of those cool little nods in this comic that I appreciate. R2 says to 3PO that he's going to fly straight at Vader, and then as that starts to happen, because R2's ship got shot, and although R2 is a good pilot, he can't outpilot Darth Vader, who's one of the best pilots in the galaxy. And so the ship takes a little bit of damage, and then in comes Han, Luke, and Sana in their own ships and things. They come by and basically shoot Vader, Han makes some sort of comment saying it never gets old, and then they all just zoom off into hyperspace together. And throughout this comic is quite cool because it mentions there's little bits which are like a log of almost, sounds like a like user manual sort of thing. And it says things like, you know, if properly maintained, your R2 unit can perform satisfactorily for a number of years, though it's best to have realistic expectations of its capabilities. And it mentions that like in these little sort of narrative bits, it says things like, the R2 astromech is not a social droid, it is designed to function alone. And it's saying that as he goes to save C-3PO. So I think this is probably the second best comic of all these. It is a really, really cool one. And just for clarity, there is a little plot hole that I think when I did one of the Star Wars specials uh, on the feed of comics in motion, there's at some point that Scott Weatherly of the 20th Century Geek mentions that how is it that R2-D2 in the prequels manages to fly with his rocket boosters and things? I think that's primarily in episode three. And then suddenly by the original trilogy, he can't anymore. Well, I looked online about this and apparently in a junior novel, so the junior novelization of Return of the Jedi, or in at least part of it, it is mentioned that his boosters basically ran out of warranty. <laughs> So obviously R2 is quite old for an astromech, you know, he was there 32 years before the Battle of Yavin, and that's from what we can tell in canon as early as we know he existed. So by this point, he's at least 32 years old, and he's a bit of machinery. So they generally do, you know, get upgraded and things like that semi-frequently, but R2 doesn't. So by that point, it's just assumed that his rocket boosters don't really work that well. There is a comic or something somewhere, I think, around the Battle of Endor. I remember reading somewhere online that his rocket boosters do briefly work at some point around the original trilogy again, but it's only fleeting. So one can assume that his rocket boosters just don't really work that well anymore. I've also managed to find a little loadout of basically what R2-D2 has as tools and things. There's a few of them here, and I just thought I'd read them to you because they're quite cool. So R2-D2's got a rocket booster, which I've already, you know, explained. Hollow projector slash recorder. Obviously, you see that in A New Hope. Uh, the periscope, which you see in Re uh, Empire Strikes Back when he's in the thing in Dagobah. 
the fire extinguisher, a hidden lightsaber compartment with an ejector, obviously Return of the Jedi, a small saw, a scomp link. Uh, scomp links are things that how droids interact with stuff, basically. It's scomp links. I first heard about it in Jedi Fallen Order. Um, an electroshock prod, which is obviously what he uses to kill or maim at least a lot of these uh, stormtroopers. He has a data probe, a utility arm, a life form scanner, and motorized all-terrain treads, which are you know, his wheels essentially. And I want to clarify as well, even though his electroshock prod is a lot stronger in this comic because, you know, Chewie made it stronger, and I'm not 100% sure if he does kill all of the stormtroopers he electrifies, a lot of the things he does in this comic does clearly kill them. He ejects lots of them into space. He gets a lot of them to shoot each other and lots of other things. So he does kill quite a lot of stormtroopers in this. And the comic ends with basically Scar Squadron has been reported to have found a rebel outpost. And that's what the next comic is tackling. So this next comic, this is issue number 37. It is called Imperial Pride. And once again, I'm going to read out the title crawl. For a mission this vital, the right team is essential. An elite group of stormtroopers handpicked for their skills, loyalty to the Empire, and complete dedication to destroying the rebellion. Leading this team is ruthless Sergeant Creel, a man who answers directly to Darth Vader. Rebel heroes Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, and Han Solo have evaded Scar Squadron before, but they have not seen the last of the Empire's wrath. So Scar Squadron in the comics have been some pretty fierce antagonists to begin with, but as the comics go on, they become less and less of a threat. And obviously there is that sort of problem with plot armor that Scar Squadron couldn't do any proper true damage to the main heroes because <laughs> they're in the films and things. Um, but they are quite cool in some ways. I've tackled them in a previous issue. I think it was uh, the third volume or something of Star Wars. But essentially in volume two that I mentioned when you meet Gracchus the Heart, when Luke is getting trained by the Taskmaster, the Taskmaster is Sergeant Creel undercover. He's a stormtrooper who has a lightsaber essentially and scar squadron they're basically like task they're called task force 99 they are very very similar to the clone troopers and clone troops 99 so in the clone war series in season seven the first arc is called the bad batch and that bad batch they you know there's a really big strong one there's a techie one there's the leader those sort of things this is basically the same as that except stormtrooper versions um and obviously there's the bad batch series coming out uh this year on disney plus in 2021 so yeah i just thought i'd point that out that didn't really go anywhere that thought but there you go so the comic starts with Creel trying to use his lightsaber and deflect against some of these training droids, which are the ones that you see Luke train against in A New Hope, the sort of floating balls and shoot things. He tries to do it and he doesn't really do a great job. And Vader says that he's too slow and cumbersome. And this is an exchange between Vader and Sergeant Creel. You are too slow, too cumbersome, too much of a stormtrooper. Try where you might, Sergeant Creel, but you will never be a Sith. With all due respect, Lord Vader, I'm not asking to be. It wasn't the Sith who saved me from dying in the fighting pits of Chagar 9. It was the 501st. I'm a trooper to the core. Sir. Clarity, the 501st Legion are meant to be one of the most elite legions of the Stormtroopers. They are Darth Vader's personal legion of Stormtroopers. But the 501st Legion was also Anakin Skywalker's legion of Clone Troopers in the Clone Wars. And Rex was the sort of main in command aside from Skywalker in the 501st Legion. If anyone's played the Legends games, because it's weird calling them Legends games, but Star Wars Battlefront 2 on the PlayStation 2 and I think on the Xbox, the 501st were quite prominent in that. And the 501st Legion are actually, they were created because of, there was actually fans of Star Wars um, that did it. But I'm not going to delve into that hugely, but the 501st Legion is a fairly well-known legion of both clone troopers. And then when the Galactic Empire became a thing, there was then a Stormtrooper Legion of the 501st. And both were basically... Anakin slash Darth Vader's personal legion. While Creel and Vader are talking, um, basically Vader says you've got your one last chance, and Creel says that if he fails this, he will personally kill all of his own troops himself, his own squad, before killing himself, which is pretty dark. Um, and then Vader says, all right, you can go ahead then. And just before he leaves, Palpatine enters, and Creel just falls to his knees, essentially, and says he's basically startled by it, and is just like kind of groveling a little bit in a kind of saying how amazing Palpatine is, whatever. And then Palpatine says, oh yeah, you're doing a great job, Trooper, whoever you are, and then starts to talk to Vader, and then both Palpatine and Vader leave. Scar Squadron head to the Horrocks system and go to Horrocks 3. Um, they basically see some of these natives who look like small goat people. I can't really see record of them anywhere else, but they're like small humanoid goat people. And then there's this really big sort of giant thing threatening them and saying, you know, basically just bullying them and stuff. Scar Squadron come in, kill this big bully, and then ask the locals, you know, where is the rebels? Where have they gone? 
So then it cuts to the Scar Squadron basically tearing apart and destroying this rebel base. They are shooting people, saying fire to things, and basically killing everyone there. And then Creel goes into a room and takes on seven rebels with a lightsaber. While he's doing that, there's this inner monologue of Creel, and one of the lines that he says is one of the main reasons the rebels will never win is because they can't kill us all, because there's just so many people in the Imperial Army and our stormtroopers and things like that. So yeah, he goes there and he kills a lot of rebels and it's pretty brutal. It's quite a cool few panels. And then they basically leave after killing everyone and destroying everything. Han, Leia and Luke arrive. It turns out there's no survivors. Scar Squadron have left some graffiti basically saying love, long live the Empire. Luke and Leia and Han burn the dead instead of burying them because they need to get out of there quite quickly. And then that's where that comic ends. I will also mention though that this comic, issue number 37, Within it, it's got the Scar Squadron story. It does also have the story the Sands will provide. I tackle that story in in the episode 32, uh, Journals of Old Ben Kenobi. Um, it's basically all about Tusken Raiders. It's a cool little story. It's fun. It's got nothing really to do with any of these stories. But it basically it seems like this volume of Star Wars is just loads of random one-off stories. And that's kind of what it is. So yeah, that's the end of number 37. Just before I delve into the final comic, which is going to be Star Wars Annual number three, I forgot to mention a couple of little bullet points of things. I mentioned Teth slightly earlier. Teth um, was first in the Clone Wars movie, which is something I do not recommend to anyone. Uh, it was then in a few other episodes of Clone Wars and things, and it's also mentioned in Master and Apprentice. There's like a first scene with Qui-Gon and with Obi-Wan. That's on Teth. It's quite. It's like a hut place, essentially, as in a hut planet. Then I also just want to mention when it came to R2-D2, there's a couple little points. Um, R2-D2 was owned by Padme in the prequels, and obviously by proxy was then kind of owned by Anakin. And then it was owned by Bail Organa, and then was owned by Luke. So basically went through all the Skywalkers in a sense. And the other thing I want to mention is some people didn't realise this, or rather Megan didn't realise it when we watched the films. The R2-D2 in the films, in episodes 1 and 2, and then the original trilogy, so 4 to 6, uh, R2-D2 was played by Kenny Baker, who was a little person who you know, went into the actual casing of R2-D2. The majority of scenes with R2-D2 in episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, they were CGI and that sort of thing and that. And then... In episodes 8 and 9, there was a little person called Jimmy V who played R2-D2 because by that point, I believe that Kenny Baker had passed away. So yeah, a couple of little tidbits there that I just kind of forgot to mention at the time. So then this leads us to the final comic, the sixth one, and this is the Star Wars Annual number 3. Now, this is set unknown time it seems to be generally kind of around the time of these other comics but as i said at the start there's no explicit timing when this was i think it's around a year after um, the battle of yavin so and it's featuring han and leia it's also worth mentioning that the star wars annual number three is written by jason latour and michael walsh is the artist and the colorist so it's not made by the same people who made all the other comics but you will find it in the sixth volume of the main run of star wars comics called out among the stars and you'll know which one it is because the cover of it is the same cover as the R2-D2 comic, which is R2-D2 in a corridor with loads of passed out stormtroopers. So here is the title crawl. In an effort to find a new staging ground for a hidden rebel base, Han Solo has led rebel leader Princess Leia to the planet of Odonna, a remote world of harsh extremes and secret alcoves long used by pirates and smugglers to avoid the Empire. But as their mission stretches on, Han and Leia find themselves cut off from their allies and lost in the caves of Odana as a massive ice storm approaches. Now for clarity, I thought I recognised the planet of Odana. Uh, I couldn't find any record of it elsewhere in canon, so clearly I'm imagining it, or it just sounds like other places. Anyway, let's get on to the narrative of this final story. So, it starts off with Han and Leia being chased out of this cave by this sort of big monster. They, and then as they're walking and sort of you know, squabbling as they often do and bickering, they are being targeted by three people. I say people, one of them is a droid, one of them is a hooded figure that turns out to be a Ricto, and one is this small little creature who doesn't seem to have a species and just looks a little bit like the Chadrafan species, which is the small meter tall rodent-like kind of bat sort of creatures. It looks a little bit like that, but isn't quite and has not been confirmed as one of those. So that's kind of what you can kind of imagine. So Han and Leia are being targeted by these three people and then a shot gets fired and things and they duck and hide behind cover. The cover is slowly getting destroyed by all the blaster fire and so Han decides to run into the caves while Leia goes into the Falcon. Han as he goes into a cave falls down and injures his ribs quite badly and the hooded figure who I've confirmed is a Nikto and calls himself Frax 
and he's basically got scarred. He's, he's got like a bad eye and part of his face is kind of ripped a little bit and things. And it turns out that Han did a job with him that essentially went bad. Han kind of betrayed him in some ways. Basically, he did a job with Han. It went badly. And then as it went badly, this Ricto decided to basically try and kill Han and Chewie because they're the ones who kind of roped him into this. And as he was doing that, Han pulled a lever when they were on the Falcon, dropped this Ricto into like this big vat of water. And then years, for like a year, he's in this coral mine, basically being a slave. And then he kills this rebel who tries to help him. And then he ends up being alone by himself on the Cordaxian Sea for like four months. Um, so it's basically he's had a pretty hard life and he blames Solar for it purely. Now for clarity, Nikto, uh, they're from the planet Kintan. Now there are several little subspecies of Nikto. They're a little bit hard to describe. They are humanoid. They've got fairly flat faces. They've kind of got horns coming out the back of their sort of jaws in a way. They are of different colors. There's generally red ones, green ones, and then sort of grayish sort of ones as well. The one that I know most well is one called Niku Vozo, and Niku is a sort of bumbling character in the Star Wars Resistance series, and in the first, one of the first seasons of the Clone Wars, there's a Jedi Master called Ema Gundy. Um, in fact, it's in the Supply Lines episode, and he gets killed. Nikto are found on the galaxy quite a lot. There's several of them all around, and there's different subspecies. Some are from the mountains, some are just different colors and things. But you would see them quite a lot in Star Wars, but they don't have a nose. They've got fairly big eyes, mouths without lips, and kind of scaly-ish in the face. And then, yeah, kind of small horns coming out the sort of the back of their jaws. What you're imagining probably looks nothing like how I've described them. But anyway, moving on. So this Richter, after going through all that sort of terrible stuff that he blames Han for, he manages to get this sort of valuable crystal thing. He trades it to the droid and that small humanoid thing to basically get revenge on Solo. While Leia's on the ship, she kind of hatches this plan, grabs a few things, and then leaves. While that's all going on, Han is in the mines, basically hiding behind things and having a shootout with these three people trying to get him. Leia comes down and she manages to go into the sort of mine cave systems through a different entrance because Han said they're all interconnected. So she kind of tries to go in there and go a different route. She manages to find Han and then she uses gasoline as a trap. She throws it about, manages her and Han to kind of start to escape and then she shoots the ceiling and causes a cave in. They manage to escape and sort of that monster thing from kind of at the start, there's like monster babies, like little versions of it. They start to kind of attack the thugs and things. Han and Leia basically get out to the sort of surface. Han apologizes and says for Leia just to leave him there and save herself because there's now really heavy snowfall coming and he doesn't think that if she has to wait for him that she'll survive. So he just says, look, just go without me. While that's happening, Frax and his allies manage to sort of escape those weird little monster things. And then they go, look, this is too much. You can keep well, that gem thing. We don't want payment anymore. We're breaking the deal off. We're, gonna, we're just going to go. Frax doesn't like that very much. So he shoots them both and then goes after Solo and Leia. I also realize I keep swapping between Solo and Han. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know what I mean. So he goes outside and confronts Solo and Leia. And as that happens, Leia shoots the entrances of where they can sort of got out. And then they're stuck out in this snowstorm and they are slowly freezing. Leia starts to run to the Millennium Falcon and Frax shoots her and just grazes her sort of ribs and things. And she collapses just as she reaches the Falcon. Everything cuts to white and then Chewie and some other rebels appear and seem to save them. It shows what Frax, and Frax is frozen in place. He shot that shot at Leia and is just frozen, as in covered with ice and that sort of thing, and has clearly died. Han and Leia manage to get saved by the rebels and sort of, you know, healed, essentially. And then Han says that he owes Leia. She says that you don't. In the Rebellion, we don't owe each other things. Sometimes you make a call, it goes wrong, that's fine, things just happen. And Han says that he's not going to leave the Rebellion until he repays her debt. And that is where that comic ends. Now, it's, it's a fairly chunky comic, the Star Wars Annual 3, and it's all right. But from my experience, I've read a couple of the Star Wars Annuals, and I'm pretty certain I tackled the first one a little while ago, and it gave some backstory to a character who appeared in that prison arc that I mentioned briefly earlier, which Dr. Afra and Sana Staros kind of interact with each other in that. Aside from that, the annuals, from what I have, to be blunt, I haven't been overly impressed by them. But as I said, I'm not the biggest fan of, like, one-shot stories in a way the age of stories are all right you know age of republic that i've finished tackling now and i'm going to be moving on to the age of rebellion ones they're all right because you do get some degree of sort of backstory to some of the sort of smaller characters and things which is quite cool but when you've got anthology stories about really well-known characters obviously han and leia are two of the most flushed out characters in star wars i'd say due to not only all the stuff in legends but
the in the canon itself obviously they are in or well, han is in four mo- well, five movies and then leia is in six of them excluding her appearance as a baby um so, and also they just in these star wars comics they're some of the main protagonists so having these weird little side stories where they you know try and find a rebel base fail and it turns out han was kind of bad to someone in the past it's all right but it doesn't grab me in that sort of way but you know if you get the collection if you get the the trade paperback of volume six out among the stars which has all these stories it's quite a fun one where you can just kind of pick up and choose which one you want and it's quite nice in some ways to be able to read some stories and they don't all interconnect and you have to remember all these sort of details and things so it was more fun than I thought it was going to be tackling these anthology stories and things. But as I said at the start, the next arc of Star Wars comics, which is going to be in four episodes time, that is going to be the Ashes of Jedi arc, which I'm quite excited about. It's going to be about characters after Rogue One and some familiar faces pop up and things. I th- I'm pretty certain they go to Jedi as well, if I remember correctly, because I haven't read this comic in several years. But as I said, it's written by Kieran Gillen, who wrote the first run of Vader comics and the Dar- and the first 19 Doctor Afro comics as well. Kieran Gillen is an excellent writer for Star Wars, and from what I can recall, the Ashes of Jedi arc is pretty cool. So. You know, that's quite exciting stuff. But next week, I ha- I haven't really been figuring out what I'm doing with these Star Wars ones. I kind of just, at the start of the week, I decide what I'm going to read and I kind of go from there. So the next one is going to be either a mini series or it's going to be more of the collections of the Age of series. I think I'm going to do one of the mini series. I'm kind of tempted to do the TIE Fighter series because I haven't read the, that yet at all. And that's quite interesting to me. But I'm also part tempted to do the Target Vader run because Target Vader gives me more backstory to a character called Belert Valance and Belert Valance was in the Han Solo Imperial Cadet comic which I tackled a while ago he was like a bit of a douche essentially and then he managed to kind of have a bit of redemption and then was in a horrible crash and had to have cybernetic enhancements to kind of keep him alive and then he gets kicked out of the Imperial Navy because the amount of work he needed done was too excessive he is then in the miniseries Target Vader, which is about bounty hunters trying to get Vader, essentially. And then that leads on to an ongoing series, which is on its 10th or 11th issue at the moment, called Bounty Hunters. So I'm going to... I've pretty much, I think I've talked myself into maybe doing the Target Vader stuff now, because the Bounty Hunter series, they are ongoing at the moment, and... They feature Boba Fett in them, they feature Bosk, and obviously the, the series is called Bounty Hunters, but it kind of focused around Bullet Valance. So I may end up tackling that one next week. I may end up doing the TIE Fighter comics. Um, I've got a couple of other mini series I think that I have not yet tackled that I'm maybe tackling. But yeah, that's what I'll do next week. Then the week after that, I'll do the next batch of Afro comics. So that's going to be the second sort of full arc of Afro, because I did the first arc of Afro a little while ago, then the Screaming Citadel crossover, then it's the second arc of Afro. And then probably the week after the Afro ones, I'll tackle the Age of Rebellion one-shot stories. And then after that, it'll be back to the Star Wars ones. So that's what you can kind of expect going forward. I am planning on doing a book review at some point, maybe of Leia, Princess of Alderaan that I may be tackling. Um, I've written a few notes about that, but doing the book reviews is quite a lot of work in a sense. And I am currently reading the High Republic book, Light of the Jedi. So once I've read that, I'm thinking about doing like a little special about that book and then also more information about the High Republic, which is set 200 years before The Phantom Menace. So kind of having a play around. If you have any suggestions or anything you want me specifically to tackle, uh, contact me on social media at Genuine Chit Chat on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook, or you can email me at Star Wars Comics in Canon at Outlook.com, um, or you know you can even contact anyone at Comics in Motion because we're on a little Discord chat and we all talk and things, so that will get through that way if so desired. I also want to mention that I have recently been on an episode of Indie Comic Spotlight, which is found on the very feed of Comics in Motion that you are likely listening to, and we tackle the comic Lone Ranger, written by the um, gentleman named Mark Russell, which both myself and Tony have spoke with on Indie Comic Spotlight as well. There's also other great shows on uh, the feed of Comics in Motion. I've been listening to all of them, including the newest addition to our family, which is the Classic Comics, uh, which is Matthew B. Lloyd's Classic Comics. He talks about a lot of the characters that are famous, that like Batman and Daredevil, in the golden age of comics which is like around the 40s and things before they became the characters we know of them today so make sure you check out all the amazing shows on comics and motion including the newest member of the family let me know what you thought about all these star wars comics and things make sure you contact me on social media and things you can ask me questions on twitter and that sort of jazz and just to pre-warn it's gonna be like 10 weeks from now but i will be doing a q a episode on episode 50 i'll be sure to do out like a twitter poll and things like that but if there's any questions you want me to tackle and things you can email me and i can email you a response and or i can tackle them 
from on the Q&A episode I'll do then. But, you know, check out my other show, Genuine Chit Chat, where I have interviews with people and things. And if you liked that Claudia Gray interview I did a little while back, that sort of thing is what I generally do on that show as well. So really appreciate you guys listening all the way to the end of this one. It is always a pleasure. Anyway, guys, thanks again for listening, and I'll talk to you guys next week. And as always, may the force be with you.